Our final speaker this afternoon is truly the man behind it all, and he's the reason we are all sitting here today. As the founder and medical director of the Stram Center for Integrative Medicine, he has worked his entire professional career to help change the face of healthcare with his unique approach and persistence in creating a patient-centered experience. He has done just that, treating the whole person, finding the root cause of one's symptoms is the tenant of his approach to caring for patients. His expertise to integrative medicine comes along with more than 25 years of emergency medical experience. He is, he's been able to merge both the complementary and traditional fields of medicine using compassionate care, clinically proven, and naturally effective remedies for the benefit of his patients. We are truly honored and grateful to present to you Dr. Ronald L. Stram. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And I especially want to thank Sarah Williams, who has organized this event, along with Monique Ordino. Uh, they have put on a great event. Uh, thank you to Eric, who I will say, we came in last night, and you know we see someone in the kitchen, and Eric is wearing his hat. So I want to say that the hat is not just there for show. It's there for him to become the chef that he is, so, so thank you. Um, well, we're gonna talk about just some of the ideas about how to navigate this concept of, of the cancer diagnosis through the idea of the biological terrain. And the biological terrain is not just what's inside you, but then that's also what you visualize on the outside. So, so what is the biological terrain? Well, it involves an in-depth look on a microcellular level of what is in you. What is your nutritional content? What is your vitamin amount in your body and how to optimize that? What is, again, your genetic predisposition? The biological terrain closely monitors uh, an environment that you have in your body and how to individually maintain and really have some effect on that environment through yourself, through really an individual approach. We appreciate the vitality in us all, that really this biological terrain plays in establishing and supporting an individual's overall state of health, vital vitality, and healing. So when we look at the biological terrain, we look at these sort of arbitrary ideas of what is involved, which could impact on either prevention or actually furthering your cancer diagnosis. The first is considered oxidation, and you've eaten some antioxidant foods, and you've witnessed some concept of oxidation. And if you want to think of oxidation, think about it as the the unguided missiles that kind of are just out there looking to just damage things and really have an impact on that environment. And really what it is is, is we are looking really in this milieu to really avoid this impact of oxidation. Oxidation is around you. When you're walking out in the sun, you have the oxidation from the sun. It's the chemicals that you potentially put on your face from cosmetics. It is the chemicals in your environment and it is specifically also the foods that you may be eating. Inflammation. Inflammation is what we all recognize, whether it's inflammation from being angry and you overheat, that's an inflammatory response, whether it is the inflammation of an illness. When you get a strep throat, your throat's all swollen and sore and it's inflamed. So this inflammation really, what we believe, stimulates and fosters progression of disease, and it weakens the immune system. It is first there to sort of fight, but then it overheats. So our goal is to cool it. One's immunity. One's immunity is not just your innate immunity, what you're genetically programmed to. 
It is the ability within you, within us, to be able to have some impact on one's own immunity. And there is a surveillance system where we can actually look at what is involved in immunity. Are there sort of chronic infective states that may impact immunity? What are the cells doing? What are the risks of surgery and other types of intervention which actually can reduce the immunity? And obviously, many of you know that the treatment that you get for cancer lowers your immunity. So therefore, how do you raise that immunity? How do you counterbalance? Because what I always tell our patients is if you don't have a good defense, then offense can kill you. So what is the circulation? That's your movement, the movement of blood, which also is about not only movement to the vital organs, but also being able to get rid of stuff, right? Because if you have high movement, it means that things are circulating and you're able to detoxify. And we spoke about detoxification. So circulation is both important in terms of its ability to move and flow vital nutrients, but it's also about getting rid of unhealthy aspects that can affect disease. Circulation is also where we may find the growth and the new growth of tumor cells. And so it is a very fine balance of wanting to increase circulation, but also not in the areas that you don't want, such as metastatic or adverse issues from cancer growth. And then I was spoken to you by Eric and most of the people here is sugar and the whole effects of the glycemic control. And that's one that we really believe is part of the fact of really what can advance the cancer cells. Because as we know, cells need sugar. And an adverse amount of sugar can really impact the growth itself. So this in itself is setting up a microcellular environment that doesn't promote growth, but if you look at it as the opposite, it is a way for you to inhibit the growth. And this was said by another person, not by myself, but the food you eat can be either the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. I picked the medicine. So the tumor microenvironment plays a key role in the growth of the tumor cells, the tumorigenesis and its progression. And as you see, the microcellular environment, when you have a normal, healthy microcellular environment, it inhibits the effect of cancer. It reduces the effect of non-differentiated cells, right? Non-differentiated cells are cancer cells. They don't know how to shut off. They keep growing, and they don't grow into something that is a normal organ tissue. They prevent something that is a natural cell death, like what's called apoptosis, and they promote proliferation. And the next part I'm going to talk to you about is controversial, because it's going to potentially throw the whole concept of cancer control through specific targeted therapies to individualized approach. Because unlike the typical thought of how tumors are seen as sort of the reductionist complex is that they are bad cells and we need to get rid of them, to the idea that they are complex tissues that have a whole microcellular environment that actually affects their growth. And that unless you look at it that, this way, the potential is, is that by treating only a specific subtype of this cell, you may be ignoring the fact that there are other subtypes within the same cell or within the same tumor that then may grow later and metastasize. And a good idea of this is that for some people that are, let's say, treated for, let's say, ER negative, so estrogen receptor negative tumor cells, progesterone negative tumor cells, HER2 positive, the most aggressive form of the breast cancer diagnosis, and that if they're treated in chemotherapy and you see a reduction of the, the tumor growth, and then six months later, there is a recurrence. 
And then if the recurrence is biopsied, what could be found now is an ER positive, PR positive, HER2 negative tumor, which means, again, that there is heterogeneity of the tumor cells, and that potentially getting core or needle biopsies is really not the best option because you're not appreciating the multiplicity of the tumor and the tumor environment. And that this intratumor heterogeneity, if you do not appreciate the fact that there are multiplicity of tumor cells and there is differentiation within the tumor itself, that this could give you a landscape that would appear simplified to only go after a single cell line. And what we believe is that is not an effective form of treatment. Because as with many aspects of life and cells, it is the Darwinian concept, the survival of the fittest. So if you, if you kill at only one aspect, other things grow. Just like if you're giving someone antibiotics just to give them antibiotics, what happens? You tend to raise those aberrant bacteria that are even more unhealthy. And you create resistance, just like we have now with some cancer treatments that are resistant to treatment and therapy. So we like to look at it as the idea of this heterogenic tumors, that they're not just all the white balls on the left side of the screen. And that if you only look at one aspect of the tumor cell, it's pretty much like taking one ball out and not recognizing that all the other balls are, might, might not be all the same. And this concept is seen not only on a microcellular environment, but also throughout the body. Because every different organ area, whether it's the brain, the liver, the lung, may create its own different microcellular environment, which then can either promote or inhibit growth. Why is it that some people that have the same diagnosis metastasize to the brain and others don't? Some metastasize to the lung. Why is that? sort of differences within the population with what appears to be the same diagnosis. So now that I kind of freaked everyone out, <laughs> it still comes back to now the concept of resilience and the concept of really um, how do you promote resilience and this multi-systemic effect and what we see, and what I'd like you to appreciate, is that those balloons that are on the top are how you raise your spirit and raise the fact that your pathology may not be something that you can control, but you can control your lifestyle, you can control your spiritual aspect, and what we believe is that you can truly control your biological terrain and therefore reduce the likelihood of this growth and its aberrant growth. Antioxidants. Much of you, if you've been treated with chemotherapy or radiation therapy, many of the physicians that may be treating you would say, avoid antioxidants. What we're going to tell you here is that we believe antioxidants can be not only helpful but protective for those that are under treatment. And antioxidants like vitamin C is a very powerful antioxidant. Um, it can be a sink to affect a decrease in free radicals, and it can help generate uh, sort of renewed DNA and renewed cell growth. And this is. One of the studies, this is a, a meta-analysis of antioxidants and people undergoing cancer treatment. And what they found is that 49 separate reports showed a decrease um, toxicity. And that if you look at metastatic breast cancer, 90 advanced whole system integrative treatment that chemotherapy combined with an aggressive anti 
oxidant therapy improves survival time by twice as long. Glutathione is one of our body's own natural healing agent. It is the sort of antioxidant that affects many of your treatments. It is the it is the it is the chemical, the tripeptide, the three the protein that helps reduce the toxicity of your chemotherapy agents. What we know is that intravenous glutathione after chemotherapy helps prevent toxicity and improves side effect profiles. And glutathione is something that we use in our practice, and it's something that we have found certainly that helps most patients either getting uh, chemotherapy or high dose antibiotic therapy. Uh, we also will use the precursor of uh, glutathione, which is called N acetylcysteine, which we also see is very effective in reducing toxicity. Uh, most people don't know, uh, but the most dangerous drug that you can buy over the counter is Tylenol. Tylenol. And people don't even think about it. You know, it's Tylenol, it's safe. You know, my doctor recommends it. It's which is always worry about whenever it says that, you know, my doctor recommends. Um, or go ask your doctor, right? Um, because Tylenol is the most dangerous over-the-counter drug that you can buy. Um, you can have one sort of full pill uh, bottle and uh, take the pill bottles and take all the pills. And basically within a week, you go into liver failure and eventually uh, die. Cysteine or N-acetylcysteine is a pretty remarkable amino acid. It is the cure for Tylenol toxicity, Tylenol overdose, if it's given in a short amount of time. Its effect is that it increases glutathione production. So our belief is that NAC may be really instrumental in some of the effects of, of both cancer itself and in helping your body rid some of the aberrant cells or the toxicities related to the cancer diagnosis, but also the chemotherapy itself. Intravenous vitamin C. So intravenous vitamin C is actually taking an antioxidant and now using a high dose of it to create a prooxidant. Prooxidants are basically what's similar to your cancer-fighting drugs. However, vitamin C is a natural vitamin that's used within your body. In fact, as mammals, us, we're one of the few mammals that cannot produce vitamin C on our own. And what we know is that vitamin C is necessary for some of the sort of healthy immune cells in your body, and, and that when you become immune deficient, you lower your levels of vitamin C. So what we have found is that there are, in some cancers, high-dose vitamin C can be used in conjunction with chemotherapy, or in some cases, on its own with th some cancers that are just not responsive to uh, chemotherapy. Now, we have a pretty strict protocol, and that is that we, we have to get um, a lab test called G6PD which if it's seen deficient, people getting high dose vitamin C can get hemolysis. It is a relatively rare uh, issue with most people, but we get it with everyone. And also the protocol should not be administered with someone receiving methotrexate chemotherapy, and uh, that is something that we would then avoid. This is just a picture of our space. Uh, this is where we believe that really, in creating this, this practice, and I will say that in creating any practice, you need the team with you to make it work. And I have a fabulous team. And, uh, and so this is part of our mission, which is what we believe is that healing starts when you walk in the door. And so we pay attention to colors and lighting and the sense that you can feel healed while you're being treated. And we do believe that that is very important. It was mentioned by Eric, and maybe not significant enough, but there is really mounting evidence that organic is 
much safer, that it reduces uh, the exposure to pesticides, which are xenobiotics, which can mimic uh, sort of hormones in your body and then cause aberrant responses. Some populations that may be exposed to high amount of pesticides living near golf courses or, or unnatural environments that have uh, plants that are active and look red and all beautiful colors all year around, your groundwater may be affected by the pesticides that are there just trying to make your, your green lawn. It's kind of crazy. Uh, we believe in organic and we believe in grass-fed no matter what you're going to eat. If you choose not to eat uh, animal protein, but if you choose to eat it, we tell you if it lives well, you know, then consider you eating it. If it doesn't live well, do not eat an unhealthy animal, right? No one would want to eat an unhealthy animal. Locked in a cage and fed bad food, right? That's, you wouldn't want to eat that. Well, then don't eat it. These are some of the cancer-fighting foods. And uh, we mentioned them here before. Cruciferous vegetables have indoles and, in, and isothiocyanates. They help to detoxify. We use foods. We use food as medicine. That's what we do in our practice. And, uh, and Eric has been instrumental in making that really part of our practice. Grapes and raspberries, they have elagic acid, which are scavengers for carcin carcinogens, and that can then prevent the alterations of DNA. Orange and yellow fruits have retinol and vitamin C. They're anti-tumors and antioxidants. Green tea, ECCG, catechexins, immunoboosting, antioxidants, and some potential for anti-tumors. As Glenn mentioned, turmeric is one of our favorite uh, herbs. If you're going to have it as a supplement, it needs to have a fat put onto it so that it can absorb past your gut. It has curcumins, it has antioxidants, anti-inflammatory effects, anti-cancer effects, antimicrobial effects. It's a great herb. So we have superfoods. Superfoods like broccoli, they can stimulate the production of phase two detoxification enzymes. And now you see that fantastic glutathione transferase which protect against uh, cancer cells. The isocyanate in cruciferous vegetables and the sulforams and broccoli sprouts have 50 times the amount than the mature plants. So often we will give, it's kind of a crazy thing in our office, we have, we have like a little broccoli sprout collection in our refrigerator that we give to people when we're giving them glutathione, so it <laughs> increases the amount of sulforams and isothiocyanates. Again, reducing the incidence and the multiplicity rates of cancer cells and aberrant cells in your body. And now we come to one of my favorite subjects, and that is the microbiome. The microbiome is actually considered now potentially as even a separate organ. And the microbiome is the fact that we are but just vessels that carry lots of bugs. <laughs> we have maybe about 10, maybe 20 trillion cells in our body. We have between 150, 100 to 150 trillion microbes. So basically, not that we want to be plastic, but everything else are the microbes. And the idea that the microbe environment should be taken lightly is clearly not a good idea. Because what we found is that some of the effects of changing the microbiome can have profound effects on the health of our culture. You take a normal child, one to two years old, coming in having lots of ear infections, being treated with antibiotics on a regular basis, what we find is, over time, you reduce a bug that we all think about as being a nasty guy, H. pylori. H. pylori is one of the bugs that can cause uh, gastric cancer and also cause, so a little bit less than that would be a gastric ulcer. But what we see is that in children, when they have low levels of H. pylori, 
they have very high levels of asthma and allergic responses. So the microbiome is not just a simple reductionist view that this bug is bad and that bug is good. It's the fact that they all try to work together on a symbiotic relationship. And that what we know is that the more diverse the microbiome is, the healthier the individual is. And I know that there's probably those sanitizers in the back that you can wash your hands and we're so afraid of germs. And, and, and yet, when we go to Mexico and eat their food, what tends to happen? You, you get sick. What happens when um, someone from another country, a developing country, comes to us? They don't have all the sanitizing. Uh, they tend to not get sick when they come here. And that's the idea that the microbiome helps to really modulate your immune system and potentially disease. So the beneficial functions of the microbiome is that it's gleaning ingredients from food, synthesizing nutritional factors such as vitamins and anti-inflammatory proteins. It's detoxifying deleterious pesticides. What we do is we work with the fact that your food is important, but we need to be able to change that microbiome. And really what we do first when you come to see us is we will say this and all of our practitioners say, we got to fix your gut first. And that's what we tend to do. It's the development of an intestinal immune system. What we find is, and it's pretty interesting because you'll find that you know, people that may have autism or, or illnesses, they tend to have gut problems, have stomach problems. We give them chemotherapy and we eradicate their cells and they mess up their gut. And then we wonder why their immune system drops. So what we know is that providing signals for these epithelial renewal and maintaining gut integrity has to be paramount in any approach to prevention and creating a good defense. And that the microbial organ acts to secrete antimicrobial products which can have negatively selective effect on pathogenic bacteria, which could, on some level, have some reason why people get sick. So there is this potential that there is a microbial aspect of cancer. We know that HIV disease causes sarcomas that tend not to usually occur with people. We know that um, human papillomavirus is seen with throat cancer in men and cervical cancer in women. We know that hepatitis, the virus hepatitis, is one of the most common causes for hepatocellular carcinoma. And interesting enough, we had a patient with a diagnosis of CLL go see a practitioner, a Dana-Farber, an oncologist, who said, you know what, I don't think you have CLL. I know your numbers show that, but it looks like you may have Lyme disease. So again, this is not a simplistic view of cancer. This is a complex view, just like you are complex. And any time you reduce it to less than that, it means you do not take the whole person. So you are not your disease. You are the human. You are the person that is a mother, a wife, a brother, a sister, a friend, who loves to play piano, who loves to be engaged in society that just happens to have this disease. And what I'm telling you here is that you do have control. So microbes are selected by inflammatory milieu, bad microbes, and this is kind of interesting. So if you've got really bad microbes in you because you're eating really bad food, they kind of support bad microbes because the good guys, they can't live in a really highly inflammatory environment. So in contrast, the beneficial microbugs, they can't tolerate that environment, so they don't grow. So unless you change what you're putting in, it's going to have a major impact on your cellular health, thereby allowing invasive bugs to maintain the inflammatory process and prevent the return of beneficial bacteria from improving your immune system and thereby leading to chronic disease. Kind of a crazy story. So it's a crazy story, right? So um, there was a, a researcher in New York City did some research on, on mice. 
and he took mice that were bred to be obese, and he fed them a diet that was half their calories. Over six weeks, they checked them, and interesting enough, they didn't lose any weight. So they did something which I'm sure some of you have heard about. It's been out there a number of times in the, in the lay press about fecal transplants. So what they did was they took a fecal transplant from a, uh, a thin, healthy mice, and they put it in the obese mice. They did not change the diet. And within six weeks, they, were, they lost 20% of their body weight. So this was actually repeated in Denmark, not with mice, but with men, of mice and men. But in fact, there weren't any women with it. So I don't know why, but they, they choose not to have women in it. But anyway, maybe because women say, no, I'm not going to take someone else's poop. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. Um, but anyway, the men did it. There were 20 of these men, and they had, they had a history of high blood pressure. They had a history of heart disease. They had a history of diabetes. And they did the same, they said the same concept. They, they reduced their calorie intake, they improved their diet, and they gave them six weeks, they had them actually exercise, and guess what? Uh, nothing happened. Uh, they didn't change any of their parameters or a blood test, nothing. Uh, but then they uh, did the same thing, and they gave them a poop transplant from, from someone who was uh, healthy and active and young and thin, and, uh, and guess what? Six weeks later, they lost 20% of their body weight without changing their diet. Now, that I wouldn't recommend because, obviously, eventually you'll get it back. But just kind of interesting. So, so the, systemic, the systemic effects is to really to train the immune system. And we kind of went over this. And so we use a lot of kind of weird stuff in our practice. And one of the things that we do to try to improve your gut health is we don't advocate because we can't do it. And I don't have a lot of donors with poop transplants. But we try to make this mimicking it with probiotics. So we do things like, um, and, and uh, the, the staff always knows because I say, you know, uh, can you please explain to this patient about a probiotic enema? And, and they're great. And the nurses are great at doing this. But it really has some pretty profound effect. We've seen some pretty remarkable results. And, and I gave a talk to some practitioners uh, uh, and in fact, I had more responses from how do you do your probiotic enema from anything else that I said. So, but this can be found on our, on our treatment options. So boosting your immune system. Uh, the intake of rich beta-glucans. These are found in, in, in mushrooms. And medicinal mushrooms are, are some of the most fascinating areas of boosting immune systems. We, we use uh, 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 Trametis versicolor, which is turkey tail. Um, we use maitake, reishi, shiitake, uh, compounds that can help your immune system. We use prebiotics. Prebiotics are really important to help with the probiotics. So prebiotics like onions, garlic. Um, we use kimchi and kombucha and things that have sort of the prebiotic formula. We want to limit saturated fats that can inhibit natural killer cell growth. Again, this was brought up by... Eric, and so melatonin, as was mentioned actually by, by Heidi when she was telling you about your pineal gland. So the pineal gland is what produces mel melatonin and, and s tells, it, tells your body to sleep. What we found is that actually in non-small cell lung cancer, 10 milligrams used in the PM improved one year survival. And with those patients with breast cancer, and this is metastasized breast cancer, 20 milligrams improved survival. And with interleukin-2, several types of solid tumors, when you use melatonin in higher doses, it can lower interleukin-2 uh, levels. And what we think is that it may modulate estrogen receptor expression. And we mentioned these are the mushrooms that we think about and use, and they can increase T and B cell function, enhance phagocytosis, which is just the eating of the bad bugs, the bad, uh, the bad cells, and, and can actually then reduce tumor necrosis factor. It can increase natural killer cell function and stimulate other immune surveillance so that you can kind of improve your overall milieu. It can also reduce some of the adverse effects of radiotherapy, so XRT and chemotherapy. 
And we mentioned inflammation. We are a big proponent of using omega-3s. Uh, again, it was mentioned as well. Fish oil, bromelain comes from the pineapple. It's a very good anti-inflammatory agent. It, um, it actually has penetration into the brain. So does Boswellia to reduce inflammation for those people that have potentially metastatic uh, brain issues. MSM is another anti-inflammatory agent, a sulfur donor. And again, here's our friend curcumin and omega-3 fatty acids. What we also use omega-3 is that it, it appears to inhibit a protein called cachectin. And if it sounds familiar for cachexia, that's because that protein is what typically makes people not want to eat. And therefore, it allows the cancer cells to eat you and because and you become not hungry. And what we found is that actually with, um, with omega-3 that it may have inhibitory effects on the breast and prostate cancer through this sort of cachexin component. And another just interesting fact about curcumin as a chemosensitizer, meaning that if you take curcumin, it seems to actually enhance the effects of the chemotherapy agent while reducing the side effects. And circulation, again, we spoke about circulation and the fact that what you want is you want good circulation to improve flow, improve detoxification. What you don't want is new vessel growth. And so what we do is we look at some markers that may have an idea if you are having any new cell growth. So when we look at you in terms of your biological terrain, we tell you in advance we're going to be taking about 12 to 15 vials of blood from you. And typically, that is so that we can really evaluate closely some of these markers, which could have an effect on showing us, are you making more vessel growth? And this is one of them, MMP9. And what we also know about MMP9 is that vitamin C therapy can reduce this effects. And that there are certain supplements like resveratrol, which is from uh, some of the compounds also seen in, in red wine, can reduce those. Vitamin C is also, you know, really great as any kind of vitamin C, like cherry juice, uh, tart cherry juice has the highest amount of vitamin C that you can get from a, from a food source. It has two grams and just four ounces, which is a lot. And we would look at fibrinogen levels. And again, just to look at your potential for vessel growth. So that's us. Thank you so much. Thank you.